A rat squeaks. An otter growls. A lizard does a push-up. Are they, in fact, talking when they do this? Months of wondering that myself drove me to animate this series about animal grammar. In today's episode, we stop trying to teach them grammar and start learning from them. Hear and watch as they build up from the smallest grammatical units. Here are some of my favorite short syllable signals animals are out there making in their natural habitats. In my past three videos, we introduced the research around animal linguistics and saw my list of, I called them, gramanimals. We then met several of the famous talking animals who'd been taught by humans to speak, to sign, and to symbolize. And we watched the academic backlash to these trained critters. An old German horse, Clever Hans, was accused of merely reacting to human cues. Later, talking dogs and dolphins and apes were debunked as products of the same Clever Hans effect. And so I promised we'd turn our attention from captive grammars to wild grammars in our attempts to keep wondering if there are truly any non-human grammars out there in the natural world. What are species doing on their own without that Clever Hans effect? Well, where should we start searching for their signals within our understanding of human grammar systems so as to be genuinely impressed by their linguistic complexity if we should ever spot parallels? Dial down. Start small, with calls that sound more like expressive syllables than content-full linguistic words or sentences. The first animal language chapter I ever read quotes Alice in Through the Looking Glass, who likens meaningless communication to kittens saying purr no matter what. Yet real felines, cats, felids broadly defined, make a dozen calls. Four panthera species share at least a hiss, prustin, roar, growl, and puff. Cheetahs let out several calls, from an aggressive hiss to a unique bird-like chirp. Most common are meows, which get directed toward conspecifics members of the same species, other cheetahs. Meows function to maintain contact or beckon, and in captivity, they extend meows to another species, their human keepers, to request help or food. Cheetah and felid vocalization generally is a young field, such solitary species, but seems like their calls are limited in number and there from birth. The three living species of elephants produce several calls. Notice the word calls again. It's the term I find throughout the literature for these types of vocalization, single acoustic animal signals we can put a name to. Calls often have variants across or within species. Elephant calls include trumpets and impressive infrasonic growls and rumbles. There's quite a lot of difference in the vocalizations of Elephus maximus versus the two Loxodonta species, like many ways to turn a single non-aggressive let's go into call response exchanges to signal get moving or even into a grumbly bee alarm. So when an elephant's experiencing discomfort or heightened emotions, in Tanzania expect to hear trumpets, where in Sri Lanka you'd hear a roar, the species' unique long roar. Giraffe communication is poorly studied, with just 21 papers in the 60 years between 1958 and 2018. They were once declared unable to vocalize at all, but a handful of studies caught them making rather elusive noises, including humming in zoos at night. Now we can talk about four types of known giraffe sounds. Hisses, snorts, low hums, and infrasonic signals. Their functions remain unknown, at least as of the paper I read from the end of the 2010s that asks the wonderful question, how do giraffes locate one another? Giant otters, who live and fish and cooperate and groom in the Amazon rainforests, make multiple calls. Adults, 22 calls, plus a rare mating call. Cubs, 11 calls. Their group calls signal social coordination and location. They have sounds for playing or soothing or keeping visual contact or coordinating hunts. Alarm calls, including snorts to warn of caimans, and wavering screams when juveniles get lost. 
They also make calls that signal their own identity, voicing their own individual otter signatures. It won't be the last time we meet such calls. And then there are the begging bouts. When a con specific catches a fish you want, you can start off a begging bout with a begging call. If that's not enough, intensify your begging with a begging scream. The fish having otter then growls to defend their catch against begging callers. We talked felid repertoires. What about canids? I read about the 20 plus calls voiced by painted dogs, which they make in single syllables, bursts of syllables, and bouts of two or more bursts, including in long distance exchanges called volleys. Among canids, their barks are particularly varied, with six bark subclasses recorded. Our friendly dog dogs have a range of calls, including group cohesion howls, play huffs, warning or guarding growls, and of course, the short range bark, which you might hear in the background. <laughs> they vocalize more than wolves and vary their barks for situations ranging from greeting to warning to playing. It's notoriously catchy. Here's a fancy word for you, allelomimetic, meaning conspecifics likely start barking too. Those conspecifics can tell a dog's emotional state and size from calls, and amazingly enough, so can fellow humans. That's right, you can guess a lot about a dog just from hearing a call. Signals are not just acoustic though. Making noise isn't the only way to go. Like humans, non-human animals communicate with other modalities. Meet the Jackie Dragon from southeastern Australia. These coastal lizards use several visual movements to communicate, including tail flicks and push-ups. If you want to be able to read a typical Jackie Dragon action sequence, learn the following order exactly. Tail flick, backward forward arm wave, push-up body rock. Interestingly, the order does matter. This sequence does not elicit the same response from conspecifics when reversed in playback. Ah, but I'm stumbling ahead of us. We'll come back to the potential for meaningful sequences. Many of us say that animals are talking to us when they do stuff like this, but how do we know these repertoires so far are signals and not just displays? I'm avoiding dragging us into the theory side of this for hours, but let's take a couple steps into the animal communication research and demarcate displays, signals, cues. Here is a list, Morton's list of motivation structural rules. High, low, raspy, tonal. What if these aren't word-like cues, merely emotions on display in sound and visual form? If heightened signals are merely direct shows of heightened emotions, then call them syllables, maybe, but they're not really human-like words. Does this otter mean give me fish, or let the begging ritual commence, or just I'm expressing emotions? Well, consider rats. They do amazing ultrasonic vocalizations, USVs, associated with social roles, territory, and courtship. Rats have two ranges, a small range around a lower frequency and a large range around a higher one. Instead of 22 kilohertz and 50 kilohertz, I'll call them low and high, but keep in mind they're both ultrasonic, high-pitched to inaudible to us. Lows are associated with freezing behavior and negative emotions, and highs with approaching and positive emotions. Simple enough. And again, they seem to chain high highs or low highs in sequences, and have even been heard letting out a low together with a high trill in one single breath call. The meanings, though, are unclear. Their squeaky syllables and sequences remain undeciphered. So I suspect at this point in our video's long animated search for animal grammar, we're at the point where we need to think about meaningful words, semantics. After all, last time we saw how a key component of human grammar is putting together meaningful pieces. So let's wonder how meaningful these animal call and gesture pieces, these syllables actually are. Next time. Thank you for watching and thanks to patrons for supporting my Gramanimals. We're halfway through the series now. Lower number of views than in the past, but I'll repeat, this is joyful work for me. Let's see it through to the end. 
and stay tuned for other linguistic projects I have in the works. Stick around and subscribe for Animals and Languages.